Welcome to Rivers United Church Online. My name is John Hunter. I'm the lead pastor of Rivers United Church. I want to welcome you to our online church experience. Today we are wrapping up a series on the life of Peter. And if you haven't been here with us the whole time, that's okay because we have saved the best message for last. So we're so glad you can be part of this today. If you missed any of the messages, you can go back on our website. All the messages are posted there. And so you can go back and listen to what we've been learning from the life of Peter. But we have one last lesson from the life of Peter, and it's a big one. And so as we get ready to look into this, I want you to think through this lens today. What is church all about? Next Sunday, we're getting ready to go back into our building after six months of being out of it. We've done church online. We've had church outside over the last few months due to the COVID and all the restrictions that we've had. And now we're ready to move back into our building. We're super excited about it. But it does raise the question, what is church all about? Now, now before I get into it, I want to make sure you know, we are going to continue to do our online church experience. And so if you're not able to join us or you're worried about COVID and stuff, please join us online. We're so, so glad that you can do that. But we want to ask the question, what is church all about? And I think with all the COVID stuff that has happened, we have really learned that we go, hey, it's really kind of made us think, what is church all about? Why, why do we do what we do? Why are we doing church the way we do it? What's important to it? What value does it have? And, and I believe that the challenge that comes from what we're going to look at today is what kind of church do we want to be? As Rivers United Church, there's a challenge that's coming today that says, what kind of church do we want to be? And so we're going to take a look today at Acts chapter 15. In fact, it's the last place that Peter is mentioned in the New Testament. It's the last time that he is in the storyline of the Bible and the last place he's mentioned in the book of Acts, and it comes in Acts chapter 15. So i got to have to kind of set it up for you just a little bit. Uh, it, this comes 20 years after Jesus had died on the cross for the sins of the world and rose from the dead. And then Jesus ascended back into heaven, and then after that, the church was started by the disciples. And when that happened, 20 years later, we find in Acts chapter 15. And they had expanded a whole lot. They had had all kinds of stuff that happened. They had been through difficult times and great times and all kinds of stuff. And it led them to this moment where they had expanded the church past Israel. Uh, the church had started in Israel. The, the main headquarters for the church was the church of Jerusalem. But they had sent many people out. They had sent one person in particular, the Apostle Paul, to start churches all over the world. So the leader for the ones to start churches outside of Israel was the Apostle Paul. And he had started many churches in some of the most strategic cities all over the rest of the world. That's what Gentiles are, if you didn't know. Anybody that's not Jewish is a Gentile. And so it was expanding beyond one race of people, and it was pretty awesome. And he came back to Israel to tell them, to the church at Jerusalem, to tell them the exciting news of what had happened and what they were doing, and they all celebrated what was going on. But he also came back to kind of handle a little conflict. In fact, Acts chapter 15 is kind of the first business meeting of the church. If you've ever been part of one of those, you realize sometimes they're good and sometimes there's a little bit of conflict. And the conflict kind of came like this. Paul had come back after starting brand new churches all over the world and he said, hey, here's the problem. I'm getting a conflicting report about what we think the gospel is and what you think the gospel is. That you're sending some stuff to the Gentile churches that says, hey, Basically, you're not Jewish enough to be a church. You're not following all of our rules. And he said, hey, man, I was a Pharisee when I started, and I realized that some Pharisees have gotten saved and come into the church, and I think that's a great thing. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day. But here's the problem, guys. You're sending out a, a, a letter to the churches, and you're saying that they have to follow all 613 Jewish laws slash customs or they can't be the church. And that's not what I've been teaching at all. What I've been teaching is, is that, that I don't front end load the gospel. That I've been teaching them that, it's, that you can come to faith in Jesus right where you are, and as you put your faith and trust in Jesus and accept him as your savior, 
and, and you get to be part of the church, then your life will change. But sometimes that takes time. And you don't have to follow all the Jewish customs. I mean, of course we follow the moral letter of the law, but we don't follow all of your customs. You, you can imagine how that went over in the church of Jerusalem. They were like, well, I don't know if we agree with that, that there are rules. And there started to become this conflict that said, what about the truth of the gospel? And then on the other side, what about the grace of the gospel? And they started to kind of go back and forth and back and forth, and it seemed like it was leading to a huge division in the church. Kind of what we're talking about today. What is church all about? Why did it start? And right in the middle of that conflict, Peter stepped up. Now, you got to understand, Peter was the one who preached the message that started the church. But now he was getting a little bit older. It had been 20 years when he was middle-aged back then. Now he's getting to be an older man, and, and he spoke up. He's no longer the lead in the church. Some other younger guys have come in, and they're leading the church. And the apostle Paul, on the other side, was the one that was the first missionary around the world, and he was kind of the star now. So there could have even been a little bit of tension there for him to go, hey, are you insecure in your position? And how will you use your influence now? Because you've already had some run-ins with Paul that he challenged you about this very issue because you liked it when the Pharisees finally came because you had been a fisherman before, and now you're kind of in the in crowd in, in Jerusalem. And while the Pharisees used to be against Jesus, now they're for him and you're popular and that's really cool. But now you have to make a choice. Is it grace or truth, Paul? Is there a way to, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this, Peter? You've got to make a choice. And so he stands up and he speaks up and he speaks to this. And I want you to see how he uses his influence. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 in verse 7, it says this, After much discussion, Peter got up and he addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. The first part here is he's saying this is not just a Paul thing, this is a God thing. That, I don't know if you remember, but even before Paul was a missionary, I had spread some of the gospel and God called me to go out and preach it. And you guys knew about that. In fact, we went over and remember that guy named Cornelius and how that God told me that, that some of the Jewish customs were just types and shadows, things that we ate that we no longer have to eat, that some food is not unclean anymore. <laughs> and they're kind of like, yeah, we remember that, but that's not really good for our argument, Peter. So please stop saying it. Peter went on to say, verse 8, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. If there's something I could get you to circle today, I don't know if you have a way to do that, but maybe just circle it in your mind. God, who knows the heart. <laughs> you see, Peter is pointing out to them, God knows the heart. That's the first place you start. And I got a feeling they're saying, yeah, but Peter, you don't understand. See, God knows the heart, but we see their behavior, you know? I mean, look at the way they dress. Look at the way they mark their skin. Look at the music they listen to. You know, there is a homeowner's association, and they're not supposed to have a fence like that. <laughs> There's a homeowners association and they park their car on the street and that's offensive to some of us that follow all the rules, <laughs> right? And he's saying, no, guys, God sees the heart, the center. In fact, isn't that what Jesus taught us? That he said, hey, the problem with you Pharisees, remember, not maybe it wasn't you, but maybe it was your, your parents or your grandparents, the Pharisees that had gotten saved, it had been a while. So he's saying, hey, he pointed out to them, he was saying, hey, guys, you're following all these rules and you're changing your behavior on the outside, but it's like this, it's like a glass. You clean it from the inside out. And, and the problem with you guys is you clean the outside of the glass, but on the inside is dead man's bones. That's kind of what he taught them. And he's saying, didn't Jesus say that? That he wants to clean us from the inside out? And isn't that what we want them to do as well? Verse 9, he did not discriminate between us and them. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. That God's not a racist. That he always intended not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world to know Jesus Christ through them. 
For he purified their hearts by faith. But I have a feeling that the Pharisees and, and the leaders in the Jew, J Jerusalem church are going, yeah, but their ways, they offend us, right? They don't dress right. They don't eat right. They don't behave right. And it's offensive to us. Peter? Okay. Let's see what he says next. Verse 10. Now then. Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? <laughs> Peter's kind of saying, isn't that right, guys? Right? I know you. Right? We can go back 20 years and believe me, I know you. Remember Bartholomew before you were a disciple and we were in high school? I remember what happened after the ball game. <laughs> right? Um, better yet, Matthew, I see you sitting over there. Do you remember what you were like before you came to faith in Jesus? <laughs> you, were a, you were a tax collector. In fact, in your own book, your own letter of the gospel account that you wrote, Matthew chapter 9, by the way, remember when Jesus came to you? And, and we were all kind of offended because like, we were down at the Sea of Galilee when he called us, and then he walked down to the wrong part of town, and, and all of a sudden, he comes up to a tax collector's booth, and he calls you? <laughs> we couldn't believe it. We were a little offended, by the way. It, it, because there's sinners, and then there's tax collectors. You were a sellout. You know, it's bad enough what the Romans did to us. But you took advantage of that, and, and tax collectors, that's what you did. But yet he called you. Not only did he do that, but he walked down the middle of the street, he went to your house, and he ate with many sinners and tax collectors. What, what's up with that, right? Because he had a purpose. And then when the Pharisees, right, you guys, parents and grandparents that came, and, and they came and they said, what are, you, what are you doing eating with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus sent out this word to them. In fact, in fact, here it is, Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's saying, dude, if we couldn't have, if we, if we didn't follow all 613 laws and customs, how are we expecting Gentiles that weren't even born that way to do it? No, let's not be hypocrites, guys. In fact, he goes on to say this. No, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. In fact, Paul, that's here today, the Apostle Paul, right? You wrote in your letter to the, to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. You said, it's by grace we've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And then you go on to say, we're a workman created in Christ Jesus to do good work. So we're not saying it's not important what they do. It's not imp we're not saying it's not important that they change their lives. What we're saying is, is that he changes the heart and then he purifies the life. In fact, guys, if there was something I could ask you to write down today, you know what I would tell you? That God purifies a heart before he purifies your life. He purifies your heart before he does your behavior. This is big for somebody today. That you come to faith in God right where you are. That God loves you right where you are, but too much to leave you there. So what does that mean? It means that God purifies your heart before he fixes your marriage. God purifies your heart before you're able to forgive, before you're able to be forgiven, before you are letting go of those insecurities and all that stuff. You've got to come to God, that God purifies the heart before he does your life. Okay. Verse 12. I'm sorry. We're going to skip down to verse 13. That's kind of where Peter ends. We'll skip down to verse 13, and it says this. When they had finished, James spoke up. Now, let me just explain who James is. James is the brother of Jesus. Now, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus until after Jesus died and rose again. And, but later, he became kind of a father figure in the church. Now, he was younger than Peter. Peter was the old man, and Peter had kind of challenged them, and now the new leadership is about to speak after Peter's influence. And he said, listen to me. We'll skip down to verse 19. He says a few things, and then he says this. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not 
make it difficult for the Gentiles who are returning to God. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles returning to God. Do you know what that is? That's a vision statement. (laughs) If there was ever a vision statement for the church, if there was ever a vision statement for our church, can I tell you what it is? We should not make it difficult for those who are returning to God. For those who are turning to God, we should not make it difficult for them. (laughs) I'll tell you something church oftentimes does, right? With our list of rules and expectations and customs and traditions. He's saying we should eliminate everything we can. Now, we, we realize there's some moral imperatives and there's some important things that we don't do away with. It doesn't mean that we just throw out truth. But it means wherever we can, we make it easy for people to come to God. I think it's the same thing we should do. Now, here's how it ends. If you want to know what happens, you can read the rest of the book of Acts. But what they end up doing is this, is they say, we're just going to give you three things. And so I wrote down what the things were. The first one was this, abstain from food offered to idols. Now, that's more of a Jewish thing, but they're saying, hey, the only law that's so important to our Jewish brothers is, is when you offer it to them, it just makes them struggle. It, it reminds them of a lot of problems from the past. And so do that for your Jewish brothers. Abstain from food offered to idols. Abstain from sexual immorality. That's, that's almost in every religion. And then abstain from eating blood. <laughs> that's gross. Don't do that. Um, and they said there are the three rules that we would say if you want to be part of the church, if you want to, if, if you want to start a church, have those three rules. They did that from 613 different laws and customs down to three. I would say they made it easy for people to turn to God. And you know what happened that day? When they sent that letter out to the Gentile churches and they received the news that they could be part, not just, hey, you're part, but you're a secondary citizen. You can be part of God's family. You can be part of the church. They celebrated. Of course they did. You know what happened to the church? Instead of the church splitting, instead of the church dividing, they came together in unity around this vision. And you know what happened when they did that? They shared the gospel. (laughs) By the way, us that have heard the gospel, those of us that have heard the good news that Jesus died and rose from the dead, it's because of them, because most of us are Gentiles, right? Unless you're Jewish, you're a Gentile. And that's why we have heard of the gospel today. And what I believe is this, is the last place that Peter is mentioned in the Bible. Can I tell you what he's doing? He's using his influence to complete the mission that God had given him. You know what Jesus had said to him in Matthew 16? He said, I tell you, you are Peter. Remember we talked about that last week? If you missed that, go back and listen to it. He said, you are Peter. I changed your name to Petra. Peter. But upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what he's saying? He's saying upon this rock where you said that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that what he was saying is this. He was saying upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what the gates of hell are? Now, it's true that that there comes a time where sin separates us from God. And if we die in our sins, we're separated from God for all of eternity in a place called hell. It's the biggest part about that is separation from God and his love. But the gates of hell is talking about people that are even living now that are trapped behind Satan's system. Do you know what that feels like? You're trapped in your sins. You're trapped in the consequences of your sins or what other people have done to you. And every time you try to get out, it pulls you back in. Have you you ever felt that in your life? That's the gates of hell, right? If you've had an addiction, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he's saying, I will use my church to kick in the gates of hell because the church was never meant to just be an organization. The church was never meant to just be an org chart or a slick model or a a list of rules, the church was meant to be a movement of God to reach people that are behind the gates of hell. (laughs) That's what Peter did. My question for us today is this, is what will we do? And what I did was, is I wrote down a couple of things. If you can, I'd like you to take some notes today and consider these things. Three drifts that we have to avoid and three commitments that we have to make. Now, I'm going to tell you, 
I, I got these from Andy Stanley. Uh, several years ago, I heard a message from him about this, and it transformed how I saw things. And I'm still, still wrestling through this to go, I need to apply this to my life as well. And so I decided I just want to use these things, and I appreciated Andy Stanley and North Point Community Church for allowing us to use these and to challenge our lives as well. So I want to give you three drifts. Now, before we go there, I just want to explain drift. You know what I mean by drift? If you boat, how many boaters do we have? <laughs> I love boating. Uh, I don't have a boat, but I do get to rent one at least maybe like once a year we rent a boat. And this year was super exciting. We were going to go to Lake Gaston and we were going to rent a jet boat. <laughs> Anybody ever have one of those? And it was supposed to go around 60. I thought I could get it up probably to 70 miles an hour. And I was so excited. But when we got to Lake Gaston, they said, hey, man, it's been so busy with all the COVID stuff and everybody wanting to get on the lake that the boat broke down. And it was so disappointing. And then they said, but I tell you what, We'll let you take a pontoon boat instead. Now, can I tell you something about me and my wife? We're not pontoon boat people. If you like pontoon boats, I'm not here to do that. If you want to invite us on your pontoon boat, we'll probably come. But, but here's the thing. We're not pontoon boat people, okay? But we, we went out in a pontoon boat, <laughs> and uh, Marie's like, floor it. And I'm like, it's already as far as it can go. This is floor it, right? It was definitely not 70 miles an hour. Okay, anyway. So we get out there and we want to swim. And then we realize they didn't provide an anchor. <laughs> so we're out there in a pontoon boat and we jump off. And before it comes back up to the shore, I have to jump back on, get the boat on and turn it around. Because why? Because it naturally drifts with the water unless you're anchored, unless you're intentional. Can I tell you something? There's some drifts that are natural to us that we have to be intentional about avoiding these drifts. Okay, here's the, here's the drifts. Number one. The drift towards insiders and away from outsiders. The drift towards insiders and away from outsiders. Do you know what I mean? If you've been in church long enough, then you know what I mean. You've been coming to church for a while, and we, we would naturally cater at, over time. We would naturally cater to those that have been here the longest and not cater to the ones that have never been here. <laughs> One is because people that have never been here never complain about anything. Why? Because they've never been here. Yet we have to be cognizant of saying, hey, God left us here to reach those that are not here. <laughs> we got to be careful that we don't just look at it from, this is what I like. This is how I like it. And not make it easy for those that are trying to return to faith in God. It could be very easily, hey, if you follow my version of Christianity, and you can get in the door, especially right now with COVID, because we have limited seating and stuff like that. My question is, is would we be willing to give up our seat for somebody new coming in? Would we be, would we be willing to help them come in? Or do we have clicks and we, we stick to ourselves? And it's real easy to do that, isn't it? So we have to avoid the drift towards insiders and away from outsiders. Number two, we have to avoid the drift towards the law and away from grace. Do you know what I mean by that? That the law says that, you know, hey, it's easy to do that. Now, we wouldn't have thought that when we first came, right? Because we didn't know much. But as you get, if you've been in the faith for five or more years, then sometimes we start to go, hey, it is important that we follow standards. And that is it's so true. It is. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's the rules, right? But we start to lean more towards it. And what we do is we start to become efficient. And so what we do is this. We go, hey, you know what's easier than just talking to people about this thing is to make categories and policies. Can I explain what I mean by that? Category center, policy, go away and clean up. Come back when you're all fixed up. It'd be very easy to do that, right? That we get very easy about not caring about the messiness in people's lives. And instead, we just do policies and categories. In fact, you don't even need to sit down. We don't even need to know your name. You can look at this list. And if you have these problems, go away, come back when you're all cleaned up. If you start thinking that way, and it's very easy to go that route, then here's what I'd like to tell you, challenge you. Go back and read Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus calls Matthew the tax collector. You might be going like I do. Hey, isn't there standards? And the truth is, there is standards. There is principles at play. But here's the problem with that. If we only gather around people who believe right and behave right, you read Matthew chapter 9, you'll figure out Jesus was saying, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came for the sinners. And if you find yourself where you only gather around believing right and behaving right, that's all good, by the way. 
But if that's all you gather around and you don't care about those that don't believe right and don't behave right, you will find yourself outside the room that Jesus inhabits. In fact, our church will find itself outside of the power of God. So we have to avoid the drift towards the law and away from grace. Number three, we have to avoid the drift towards preserving rather than advancing. Okay? Um, if you're a small business owner, then you know what we mean. When you start a small business or like a church planner, I'm a church planner, so I get this, you risk a lot at the beginning. Sometimes we didn't have a lot and we risk whatever we had. But then as you go and you grow and you get more profits and things happen, then you start to become risk adverse because you go, I don't think I want to lose it more. That's how we become as the church. Over time, we start to become risk adverse. Hey, I don't think I want to risk that. In fact, the Jewish people, they didn't want to, they were trying to preserve the law. That's okay. Jesus never said he's, it's worth preserving. He just said, I don't want you to err on the side of preserving the law and not advancing the gospel, not advancing my kingdom. <laughs> we got to decide as a church what we want to be about, but we'll drift towards preserving. In fact, we even have a hymn for it. It's called Hold the Fort. <laughs> and while I love old hymns sometimes, that one I really struggle with because God didn't call us to hold a fort. He called us to build his kingdom. He called us to advance his kingdom, not just to hold the fort. And so I'm challenging us today to say we have to risk our reputation. We have to risk the messiness of getting involved with people that don't believe right and don't behave right, and it's difficult and it's hard, and, and we might even have to risk our reputation because the church down the street thinks, hey, what are you doing, right? These are the drifts we have to avoid. Okay, I want to give you three commitments that we need to make. Number one, let's be bold. The commitment we have to make is let's be bold. Let's not just maintain. Let's be bold. Let's be bold. A couple areas. We need to be bold in our inviting right? It's difficult right now. I'll be honest. Some of you guys are watching it online and you're nervous about the COVID stuff and you can't come. How do you invite somebody? We have to get creative. Maybe it's join a watch party with them. Maybe it's having them, you know, and you join them through Zoom or something else and we go, hey, that's uncomfortable and I don't like it. And I understand all that, but we have to be bold in our inviting. We have to be bold in our welcoming. How many people do you welcome? If you are going to come to church or even if you're not, do you welcome people or do you just wait for them to come and, and if they can get in, then that's just totally fine. But, but bold in our welcoming, bold in our serving. We have several areas in our church that you could serve right now. And my question for you is this, it's not just where you serve in the church, but where is your heart with this? Are you bold in your serving? Or are you kind of stepping back and going, well, I'm kind of tired and I'm kind of busy and aren't we all, right? bold in our serving, bold in our giving. You go, how dare you say anything about giving money? I, I didn't say money. Whatever God has given you, would you give that back to him? But I will say, even with money, I would say, hey, are we going to be bold? Or are we just going to try to preserve, right? Hey, this is a tough time. And even though I'm not in a tough time, I'm just holding on to everything and I'm not going to give any out. And God cannot bless us as long as that's what we're doing. Okay. Well, let's be bold. The commitment number two is this. Let's always err on the side of grace. Now, that one I kind of struggled with <laughs> because I was kind of like, well, you know, are we sure that's right? So if you, if you have a problem with it, just email Andy Stanley at North Point Community Church. I'm sure he would love to hear that. And he'd be like, who are you guys? But anyway, um, but as I looked at this over the years, I realized it is dead on. It does not mean that we err on the side of grace and forget about truth. What we mean is this. When it comes to a policy or grace. Let's err on the side of grace. Let's err on the side of having conversations with people, not just hitting them with a policy. I've never seen the life that changed because of a policy. I've seen many lives that when the person took time to extend grace to them instead of just a policy, it changed their life. So I would say, let's be a church that extends grace, not just our policies. Okay. The last one is this. Let's remain open-handed. Let's remain open-handed. You know what I hope for our church? I hope that we'll risk more in the future. I hope that we won't just be a church that preserves but advances. If you need a verse for that, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus compares our lives 
to that of somebody that, that, that's like a master that gives out money to his servant and, and the ones that come back to him and they say, hey man, we've advanced and we've, we've, we've created more profit for you and they say, great, well done. But the one that came back and he preserved his life and he held on to it with everything with it. He didn't want to tarnish it. And he presented just what he had back to him. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. You can read it in Matthew 25. He said, you cast him out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You might be saying, are you saying that I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we will not have the power of God as long as we're holding on and trying to preserve. So here's my challenge for us today. Will we be a church that instead of trying to preserve something, advances something? (laughs) Will we be a church that God can use? I believe this. If we avoid these drifts and we make these commitments, I believe that God could use us to build his church. And I believe this. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So here's my question for us today. What kind of church do we want to be? Can I pray for you today? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. Lord, I thank you for the powerful example from the life of Peter. That he used all his influence to advance the gospel. I'm praying, Lord, for Rivers United Church today that we will be that kind of church, that we won't just be about preserving, but we'll be about advancing, that we won't be scared of the messiness of getting involved in people's lives, but but we'll do that with your power. And God, I believe if we move forward, you'll empower us to do it, and you'll do just like you did with the church in the book of Acts. God, I'm praying for the one that goes, you know what, I, I know all about the gates of hell. Maybe somebody's stuck behind it today. I'm praying for them right now that they call out in their their own words and that you'll reach out to them that maybe for the first time they realize there's a God that loves them right where they are and they want out and they don't know how to do it. And maybe the first place they got to start is just to call out to you and ask for you to help them, realizing that you died on the cross for their sins and you rose from the dead and you're offering them resurrection power today. God, I pray for all of us. Help us to be a church that's advancing, not preserving. Make us that kind of church, God. We'll give you all the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.